Well, welcome. Oh, hold on. Welcome everybody to Buddhist Center. Here we are Sunday. <laughs> we made it. We're all still breathing and we're all still able to listen to the teaching. And uh, so it's a win-win so far. Uh, and any time that we can listen to Lama Tsongkhapa's great treatise on the stages of the path to enlightenment or anything about the teachings for beings of three capacities, which really encompass all of Lord Buddha's teachings, uh, we're doing okay. Uh, so a little sigh of relief if you're having any kind of stress in your life and know that you've met with the Dharma. Uh, you've met with these incredible teachings that will allow us to achieve fearlessness eventually and not have to deal with the things that you're stressed out about uh, and have infinite happiness. While not only will you not have suffering, uh, but a Buddha not only is free of suffering, but also has complete bliss at all times and moves from bliss to bliss to bliss. Uh, and does so while being able to be the most reliable guide to all sentient beings. Uh, sentient beings like us who have to experience the various types of suffering of birth, aging, sickness, and death, uh, and have to have the various stresses in our lives, and we move towards things we're attached to and push away things that we have aversion towards. Uh, and when we can't get what we want, we sit in a state of stress. <laughs> and when we can't push away what we don't want, we sit in a state of stress. Uh, and these teachings allow us how to become more reasonable about uh, all objects and all interactions that we have uh, because we don't normally think of them in the right way. So before we get further uh, into the teachings or any kind of talking, uh, just again, rejoice in the fact that you're here today on a Sunday. You could be a million different places and billions of sentient beings aren't here or aren't somewhere listening to the Dharma. Uh, they think there's another solution that we previously thought was the solution. Uh, and now, luckily, we know that the teachings of Lord Buddha are really the solution to our uh, lack of happiness uh, and rejoice in the fact that we've met with them. So uh, let's get into the seven point Virakana posture that we've gotten into so many times before and get our minds to a more realistic state and get them to a place where we can think about the teachings. We can have the wisdom arisen from hearing. That's so, so, so important. Uh, we have to hear so many different types of teachings or the wisdom it's called arisen from learning. We have to learn so many things uh, and so many things and refine that learning so much that when we get to that next wisdom, the wisdom arisen from analysis, we'll really know what the correct object of observation of our analysis is uh, because we'll have refined it through our learning so well. And then once we become concrete on what we've learned so well through that analysis, then we can actually have the wisdom arisen from meditation, the actual application uh, of that wisdom uh, to help combat all of the negativities that we don't want to experience. Uh, so let's get our uh, self more realistic uh, right now uh, and kind of get rid of the things that we came into before the teaching, unless they were great things, unless they were, you know, I can't really, I can't wait for this teaching so I can learn how to get rid of the afflictive obstructions and the obstructions to omniscience. If that was your motivation, you know, from the moment you turned on Zoom or Facebook or TikTok or wherever you are, uh, then awesome, keep it going. Uh, but a lot of us, like myself, um, you know, had a lot of different thoughts that weren't necessarily connected to specifically just becoming a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. So let's try to get those thoughts out of our mind, which aren't, you know, correctly directed uh, and get ourselves to a more kind of neutral place so that we can correctly direct our minds to that place where we would say, oh, day and night, I wish to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. I want to bring sentient beings to a state of happiness, a state where there is freedom from suffering. Uh, and, and we'll eventually get to a place where day and night, which that will be our thought. And when we couple that with wisdom, we can actually achieve the infinite happiness and fearlessness that we wish to. So let's get into the seven point Virakana posture, get our minds calmed down, realistic, uh, so that we can direct them towards enlightenment. And we're in the seven point Virakana posture. I won't go over it. And we'll add the focal object now of our meditation. So we have our posture down, our physical posture. Now we think about the focal object. We're going to have the same focal object we always do, something we can practice with. Uh, it's the breathing in and breathing out and the counting of the breath. And then adding an, a fourth focal object, breathing in one, breathing out two, counting the breath three, and then a fourth focal object. Uh, which is Buddha Shakyamuni in the front generation, about an arm length away, the size of our thumb, about eye height, 
Buddha Shakyamuni is right behind me if you don't know what Buddha Shakyamuni looks like. And you're trying to imagine this with your mental consciousness. You're not trying to actually have your eyes suddenly see Buddha Shakyamuni. You're trying to have your mental consciousness visualize where I was saying, an arm length away, size of your thumb, eye height, Buddha Shakyamuni in a very static form. Beautiful and radiant, but static. So breathing in and out and counting and Buddha Shakyamuni in the front generation in a static form. And you're going to watch to make sure that your mind isn't running in one direction and excited and scattered or sleepy and dull. So you're checking for these two obstacles of meditation. You're checking it with the spine, your mind we call introspection, which you should keep in your mind at all times throughout your daily life to see uh, that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, so you have this kind of subtle little spy that's saying the mindfulness says my my focal object is breathing in and out in the counting in Buddha Shakyamuni. Uh, it, and, and that's what I'm supposed to not forget. That's my mindfulness. Uh, and the spy of introspection is seeing whether I'm successfully completing that task of staying on that focal object without being scattered or being dull dull or sleepy. And if there's any kind of scattering, then you won't be able to have, once you direct this concentration at wisdom, a stable wisdom. Uh, it, it, you know, if, if it, if it, if, if it isn't really calm, you won't be able to have a stable wisdom. And, and if that, and, and, uh, if, if then your mind is really, really dull, uh, when you point it at wisdom, you won't have a bright, clear wisdom. So you want to make sure that the, the meditation that you're doing gets you to the point of uh, kind of stability and clarity uh, so that when you're pointing it at the object of observation, say, uh, emptiness, the nature of reality, uh, it'll be very stably focused on that and very clearly focused on that. Uh, so we're developing a tool now that we can eventually use to point at other things and use in our daily practice, use in our studies, uh, so that we can really focus in on things in a way that will speed up uh, our kind of pathway. Uh, it will make it so we'll get to that state of Buddhahood, fearlessness, and bliss much quicker, uh, and we won't have to waste so much time because our mind will be so much more efficient. Uh, so uh, that's what we're going to do, uh, and we're just going to keep checking. Are we, are we on that focal object? Uh, is it running off, or is it getting dull and sleepy? And if it is, then mindfulness brings it right back. So let's start there. We're so fortunate to have met with these teachings. Buddha Shakyamuni was so kind to come 2,600 years ago and expose the truth of reality, show us exactly what our reality is, show us that we all have Buddha nature, we all will become Buddhas. All we have to do is engage in a pathway which will eradicate the afflictive obstructions and the obstructions to omniscience. Right now, our mind is sullied, but our mind is in the nature of clear light and unsullied. Those stains can be removed. Our mind can mature. That mind that can mature is empty of inherent existence. Therefore, it can mature. Our mind's emptiness of inherent existence has the same nature of emptiness of inherent existence as the Buddha's mind does. we will all become Buddhas. Now imagine that Buddha Shakyamuni becomes very animated, is no longer in a static state. Imagining that Buddha Shakyamuni is so pleased that we're engaging in pathways which will produce the results of fearlessness and bliss, or pathways which will actually get rid of the afflictive obstructions and the obstructions to omniscience. 
we're looking at the great treatise on the stage of the path to enlightenment by Lama Tsongkhapa, which can, contains all of the stages of the paths that Buddha presented in the sutras and tantras and rejoice in the fact that we've met with these teachings and Buddha Shakyamuni is so happy that we're participating in our actual uh, goals. We're participating in the practices which will produce what Buddha Shakyamuni came to show us we can produce and that's fearlessness and bliss. Now imagine that Buddha Shakyamuni has been containing the entire merit field. Now imagine that all in the space in front of you, all the holy, holy beings emerge, all the gurus, buddhas and bodhisattvas. Imagine Imagining that you see His Holiness the Dalai Lama smiling, so happy that we're all here engaging in practice. Ken Sergeshe Wandak, who we've had so many experiences with for so many years. I feel so fortunate and blessed to have sat next to Rinpoche for so many, so many years and so many teachings. He's so happy that we're continuing the teachings. Imagine that Kensar Geshe Wandak is also in the space in front of you, imagining Geshe Lopsang Gompo and, and uh, Gen Gyatso, Ken Rinpoche, and Demolocha Rinpoche, and imagining Geshe Dorje Damdu, and imagining Umzala Geshe Aga, and Geshe Mala Tenzin Ladrinla, imagining all these holy beings such as Lama Zopa Rinpoche, and Jeffrey Hopkins, and Lama Alan Wallace, and Ani Tupton Children, imagining them all here. They're so kind to take so much of their time and energy to help others and to shine the light of Dharma on the world. Imagine now that all the extensive deeds, be, uh, lineage be, beings are in the space in front of you, that holy lineage passed down from Buddha Shakyamuni to Matrayana Sangha and Dharmakirti and Dignaga and Vimukta Sena and Hari Bhadra and, and Shakya Prabha and Guna Prabha. Imagining all those holy beings in the space in front of you and Lama Salingpa and Lama Atisha who ho also hold the uh, Lama Salingpa holding the lineage of Bodhicitta according to a Sangha, that seven point cause and effect for realizing the mind that aspires to enlightenment that we've learned so many times from these great masters such as Rinpoche and His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Rejoice in the fact that we're so connected to this lineage. We're able to analyze the texts and understand the various paths and so forth because of this lineage. Rejoice in the fact that we've connected with it. Now think of all the beings in the profound view lineage passed down from Buddha Shakyamuni, Manjushri, and Nagarjuna, and Buddha Palita, and Aryadeva, and Chandrakirti, and Shanti, and Shanti Deva, and so forth. Imagining all of these holy beings, Baba Vega, Shandara Shita, imagining them all there, right there, Kamala Shila in the space in front of you. Imagining again, Salimpa. Uh, who also held the lineage of the exchanging self with others practice that we're so connected to. It's part of that profound view lineage, which was passed down from Buddha Shakyamuni to Nagarjuna and so forth. We're so blessed to understand that the nature of reality has been presented so clearly in the profound view lineage, the interpretation of the second turning of the wheel of Dharma that shows us this is a definitive teaching. This, the Buddha meant what he said when he said that all phenomena lack inherent existence. We're so fortunate to be able to understand through the commentaries of these great beings what this means. And then by understanding what this means and combining it with bodhicitta, we'll be able to become Buddhists so quickly. These beings are so kind to us to, as Geshe Dorje Damdu says, spoon feed us with this information. And our kind lamas have been so kind to us to spoon feed us with this information so that we'll be able to achieve the results that they've achieved. Now imagine Lord Atisha, who integrates all these paths right there and the, the lineage of blessings passed down from Vajradhara to Saraha and Matripa and Tilopa and Naropa and Marpa Lotsawa and Milarepa and Gampopa. That incredible Lamrim text that Gampopa wrote to illuminate the Dharma for more beings. So fortunate that Milarepa taught him so well. Now imagine the Drone Topa, that holy master that Lama Atisha passed the entire Lamrim lineage down to that lay Lama imagining the three Kadampa lineages, imagining all the holy beings of the Nyingma, Sakya Kaju and Galupa, imagining Padmasambhava and imagining Sakya Pandita and the Karmapas and, and Lama Tsongkhapa. And Lama Tsongkhapa, you see the two spiritual sons, Kirtup Jay and Jelsup Jay, and you see Basu Chiji Jetson and Jayan Sheba and Jayan Gabi Lodru and Janja Ruby Dorje and Gonchu Jimmy Wampo and Seventh Dalai Lama. All of these beings who are so kind to us to elucidate the path and give us just such great material to work from, to engage in the wisdom arisen from learning from or hearing from so that we have proper topics to analyze and then integrate into our meditation, actually make part of who we are. Rejoice in the fact that we're so connected to these beings. And then also in our lifetime, we're able to meet with the tantric teachings. 
it's such a rarity. Only a few Buddhas will, who will come will teach Tantrayana. And we've met with teachings of Buddha Shakyamuni, which show the entire path of Sutra and Tantra, that incredible Vajrayana path that's so rare we've been able to meet with. So imagine all of the highest yoga tantra deities such as Kala Chakra and Chakra Sambhava and Guya Samaja and Yamantaka, imagining these holy beings, Hey Vajra, all of them uh, in the space in front of you, the performance, the yogic tantra and performance tantra deities, action tantra deities. So many of us have had initiations from Rinpoche and from His Holiness the Dalai Lama into the action tantra set of Chen Rezig and Medicine Buddha and Vajrapani and, and Manjushri. Uh, and Tara, we're so fortunate to have had all of these initiations. Imagine them all in the space in front of you. Any of these initiations that you've had, any of these deities that you're connected to, and know that you will connect with all of these deities in the future because of the kindness of your Lama. Now imagine all of the 35 Buddhas, all the protector deities, the protector deities of the small scope. The Raishravana is there. Imagine the protector deities of the medium scope. We see Kalaputra and Dharma Raja, the protector deity of the great scope, Mahakala. We see that all the Dharma Dharmapalas there. We see the Paldin Lamo, the wrathful emanation of Tara in the space in front of us, who Rinpoche said was our protector. You can have a sigh of relief that you have all of these incredible holy beings that are part of your family, part of your lineage, that will be part of the reason that you become a Buddha. And they're all in the space in front of you, and they're so animated and so happy that we're engaging in pathways which will allow us to become Buddhas, because that's the only reason that these holy beings appear in this world is for us to be able to be liberated, to teach us the truth of suchness so that we can be liberated. And they, all these beings see that we're engaging in the studies of renunciation, bodhicitta, and emptiness. And just imagine that an incredible amount of bliss goes over the entire merit field. So much happiness. You can experience it yourself. Feel it yourself. Just bliss radiating from the merit field. Now imagine that you bring all sentient beings here. Uh, because even though many of us are not bodhisattvas yet, when we become bodhisattvas, we'll be able to figure out how to really help each and every single sentient being in their own individual way. And the Buddha is the one who can truly do this because the Buddha is the only being that's omniscient and truly knows how to help every single sentient being in their own individual capacity. But we know that we're going through the Lam Rim today. We know that we're going through the teachings for beings of three capacities that encompass everything that every kind of sentient being would need in order to become liberated. So we know that this is medicine for all beings. And what we can do from our side right now is imagine or pretend uh, that we're able to do the things that bodhisattvas and Buddhas can do. So we're going to imagine that we bring every single sentient being in the universe here uh, that is doing, that is in need of purification. It is in need of having the afflictive obstructions or the obstructions to omniscience removed. Uh, so we see that all beings that exist in the universe are here now. We imagine that all we, because beings are either sentient beings or not sentient beings in terms of, of uh, beings with consciousness. And the Buddha is not sentient being. And all other beings that have not gotten rid of the, afflict, the uh, afflictive obstructions and the obstructions to omniscience are sentient beings. So we imagine that every being in the universe is here, the Buddhas and sentient beings. Imagine all the hell beings are here, all the hungry ghost beings are here, the animals, the humans, the demigods and gods. Imagine that you bring every single sentient being here, leaving out none. Our Buddhahood will depend upon all sentient beings. So we bring them all here. All sentient beings are so kind to us because even the ones that cause us to have you know, disturbance of mind are the only types of beings that can teach us patience. And the only way we can become Buddhas is by perfecting patience. So we bring all sentient beings here, no matter what, because we know that we have to put others' needs before our own if we want to become a Buddha. And by doing so, we then fulfill all of our own needs. And if we want to fulfill all of our needs and all sentient beings' needs, we must become a Buddha. And the only way that we can become a Buddha is to be willing uh, to interact with, in a helpful way, every single being in the universe. 
So imagine that you brought all beings here. And now all the gurus, buddhas, and bodhisattvas have more bliss than you could have ever imagined was possible because they see that all sentient beings are here and there's no bias. There's no problems. Everybody's here for one purpose. And that one purpose is the purpose that all the gurus, buddhas, and bodhisattvas appear. The one purpose that they come into our world, and that is to shine the light of dharma on, on those of us who are in darkness. Uh, and all the gurus, buddhas, and bodhisattvas see uh, that all of those of us who are in darkness, uh, some of us in more darkness than others, are here and are, are not experiencing whatever pain that's keeping them uh, from being able to hear these teachings properly. There's a pause on that pain, uh, that, 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 that that pain isn't here at the moment. Uh, and there's just an openness and a willingness to hear all of these teachings and that you're leading them in these prayers. Now we're going to uh, do the King of Aspiration prayers. Uh, imagine we're leading all sentient beings in this prayer. And that uh, we're making all of the seven limb offering to the merit field. Uh, and we'll start there. Uh, I think I can see it. The king of aspiration prayers. Samanta Bhadra's aspiration to good actions. The Sanchi Mulam from the Ganda Vyuha chapter of the Avitamta Tamsaka Sutra. Jakagado Arya, uh, uh, in the language of India, um, Arya, Bhadra, Charya, Prana, Dana, Raja, in the language of Tibet, Papa, Zambo, Jubi, Molangi, Jelpo. Okay, so we'll begin with the translator's homage. Uh, I won't read the sections, um, you, but you can read along the, actually, I will read the sections because there, everyone isn't seeing this PDF. Okay, so we begin with the translator's homage, homage to Manjushri, the youthful. Now, the seven limbs, prostration. To all the Buddhas, the lions of the human race and all the directions of the universe through past and present and future, to every single one of you I bow in homage. Devotion fills my body, speech, and mind. Through the power of this prayer, aspiring to good action, all the virtuous ones appear, vivid here before my mind, and I multiply my body as many times as atoms in the universe, each one bowing in prostration to all the Buddhas, in every atom preside as many Buddhas as there are atoms, and around them all their bodhisattva heirs. And so I imagine them filling completely the entire space of reality, saluting them with an endless ocean of praise, with the sounds of an ocean of different melodies. I sing the Buddha's noble qualities and praise all of those who have gone to perfect bliss. Now offering. To every Buddha, I make offerings of the loveliest flowers, of beautiful garlands, of music and perfumed ointments, the best of paracels, the brightest lamps and finest incense. To every Buddha, I make offerings, exquisite garments and most fragrant scents, powdered incense heaped as high as Mount Meru, arranged in perfect symmetry. Then the vast and unsurpassable offerings inspired by my devotion to all the Buddhas and moved by the power of my faith in good actions, I prostrate and offer to all you victorious ones. Whatever negative acts I have committed while driven by desire, hatred, and ignorance with my body, my speech, and also with my mind, before you I confess and purify each and every one, rejoicing. With a heart full of delight, I rejoice in all the merits of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, Prachika Buddhas, those in training, and the Arhats beyond training, and in every living being throughout the entire universe, imploring the Buddhas to turn the wheel of Dharma. You who are like the beacons of light shining through the worlds, who pass through the stages of enlightenment to attain Buddhahood, freedom from all attachment, I exhort you, all you protectors, to turn the unsurpassable wheel of Dharma requesting the Buddhas not to enter nirvana. Joining my palms together, I pray to you who intend to pass into nirvana, remain for eons as many as the atoms in this world and bring well-being and happiness to all living beings. Now the dedication. What little virtue I have gathered through my homage, through offering, confession and rejoicing, through exhortation and prayer, all of it, I dedicate to the enlightenment of all beings. Okay, now we'll recite uh, the Heart Sutra.
The Sutra of the Heart of Transcendent Knowledge. Thus have I heard, once the Blessed One was dwelling in Rajagriha at Vulture Peak Mountain, together with a great gathering of the Sangha of monks and a great gathering of the Sangha of Bodhisattvas. At that time, the Blessed One entered the Samadhi that expresses the Dharma called Profound Illumination. And at the same time, Noble Avogadeshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasapa, while practicing the Profound Prajnaparamita, saw in this way. He saw the five skandhas to be empty of nature. Then through the power of the Buddha, Venerable Shariputra said to Noble Avogateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasapa, how should a son or daughter of noble family train who wishes to practice the profound Prajnaparamita? And this, dressed in this way, Noble Avogateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasapa, said to Venerable Shariputra, O Shariputra, a son or daughter of noble family who wishes to practice the profound Prajnaparamita should see in this way, seeing the five skandhas to be empty of nature. Form is emptiness, emptiness also is form, emptiness is no other than form, form is no other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, perception, formation, and consciousness are emptiness. Thus, Shariputra, all dharmas are emptiness. There are no characteristics. There is no birth and no cessation. There is no impurity and no purity. There is no decrease and no increase. Therefore, Shariputra, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no perception, no formation, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no appearance, no sound, no smell, no taste, no touch, no dharmas, no eye datu up to no mind datu, no datu of dharmas, no mind consciousness datu, no ignorance, no end of ignorance up to no old age and death, no end of old age and death, no suffering, no origin of suffering, no cessation of suffering, no path, no wisdom, no attainment, and no non-attainment. Therefore, Shariputra, since the Bodhisattvas have no attainment, they abide by means of Prajnaparamita. Since there is no obscuration of mind, there is no fear. They transcend falsity and attain complete nirvana. All the Buddhas of the three times by means of Prajnaparamita fully awaken to unsurpassable, true, complete enlightenment. Therefore, the great mantra of Prajnaparamita, the mantra of great insight, the unsurpassed mantra, the unequaled mantra, the mantra that calms all suffering should be known as truth, since there is no deception. The Prajnaparamita mantra is said in this way. Te ata om gate gate paragate parasangati bodhisoha. Thus Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasapa, should train in the profound Prajnaparamita. Then the Blessed One arose from that samadhi and praised Noble Avogateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasapa, saying, Good, good, O son or noble family, thus it is, O son or noble family, thus it is. One should practice the profound Prajnaparamita just as you have taught, and all the Tathagatas will rejoice. When the Blessed One had said this, Venerable Shariputra, Noble Avogateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasapa, that whole assembly in the world with its gods, humans, asuras, and Gandharvas rejoiced and praised the words of the Blessed One. Aga <laughs> make a mandala offering of a perfect universe uh, to perfect beings. Uh, so uh, just imagine that we're offering this perfect universe and that the beings residing in it are so happy and so content. Uh, the gurus, buddhas, and bodhisattvas want us to all be practicing, imagining you're offering your practice. It's contained, contained within this perfect universe because uh, that's the most wonderful offering that you can make, the offering of your practice, really. That's all the gurus, buddhas, and bodhisattvas want. Uh, that's all Ken Sergeshe Wandak really wanted, was for us to practice uh, in whatever you know, way he would need to, to help us to um, kind of get that, <laughs> uh, he would go about doing. So the fundamental ground is scented with incense and strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this is a Buddha land and offer it. May all sentient beings enjoy this pure realm. 
Holy Lamas high, wrap the sky of your Dharma bodies in massive clouds of knowledge and love, and let them pour upon the earth of your disciples as we are ready, a shower of rain, the teachings deep and wide. I send forth this jeweled mandala to you, precious Guru. The prayer of refuge in Bodhicitta. And again, if you're listening to the Dharma, say listening to the Dharma. If you're teaching the Dharma, you say teaching the Dharma. So it'll say through the merit I create by listening to the Dharma. I'm not going to say that, but don't follow what I'm saying because you're listening to the Dharma. I'm teaching the Dharma. So say the merit I create from listening to the Dharma uh, so that you're, you're directing it you know, to Buddhahood correctly, you know, the right merit. You're direct pointing it at your Buddhahood correctly. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddhas, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the merit I create by teaching the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddhas, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the merit I create by teaching the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddhas, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the merit I create by teaching the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. Sanjay Chodan Zoji Janan Laha Chanju Badu Dani Jazuchi Dagi Chuji Dipe Sonanji Drola Penche Sanjay Trubasho Sanjay Chodan Zoji Janan Laha Chanju Badu Dani Jazuchi Dagi Chuji Dipe Sonanji Drola Penche Sanjay Trubasho Sanjay Chodan Zoji Janan Laha Chanju Badu Dani Jazuchi Dagi Chuji Dipe Sonanji Drola Penche Sanjay if you are attached to this life, you are not a spiritual practitioner. If you're attached to samsara, you have no renunciation. If you're attached to your own self-interest, there is no bodhicitta. Uh, if there is grasping, you do not have the view. And that, again, is by such and Konga Nimpo uh, that he got when he was a little boy in a vision from Orange Manjushri and was told that this is the whole thing. It's called departing from the four attachments. Uh, and really, when we look at the Lam Rim, it's the whole thing. It's everything that one needs uh, in order to become a Buddha. Uh, so here we are uh, on a Sunday. And we've been looking at the Lam Rim on a Sunday for half of my life. <laughs> and uh, I feel so fortunate that we've done that uh, because it's had really an effect on my life. Uh, it, it's had an effect on my mind. It's had an effect on you know, how I view things around me in a, in a complete way. The, the way I look at things is totally different uh, than it, the way that I used to look at them because of this holy text called the Great Treatise on the Stage of the Path to Enlightenment uh, and those incredible commentaries by the Indian pandits that this helps explain. Uh, and then ultimately the teachings of Lord Buddha, the sutras and tantras, uh, that both of those things help explain. You know, the, the commentaries in the Tibetan tradition, commentaries in the Indian tradition are all meant to elucidate what Buddha Shakyamuni was talking about. And Buddha Shakyamuni was doing it so skillfully and giving so many teachings uh, after his historical enlightenment uh, that he was in a position where he had to speak from a very diver in very diverse ways. Um, because as we all know, everyone's different. Everyone doesn't have the same affinities and needs. And some people, you know, I notice seem to be more compassionate than others. Some people get the Dharma like this. Some people don't get the Dharma like this at all. <laughs> it seems like, you know, 30 years later, very basic topics are foreign. Uh, whereas people after six months or so can study, you know, complex topics, the basic topics they learn right away and complex topics they you know, uh, can learn so, so quickly. So we see these varying degrees of mind, mental states, even in our lives, when we look around at people that we know. So the Buddha was faced with this kind of difficulty of what should I teach exactly? How could I give a universal concept? And it wasn't possible uh, because of these varying degrees of, of, of mind, mental states that sentient beings possessed and these various imprints from their previous lives that were driving uh, how they saw the world uh, and the various negativities that they were more habituated than others uh, that they were connected to uh, that were going to need different antidotes and more forceful antidotes than others would need. Uh, so the Buddha being omniscient uh, had to kind of freestyle <laughs> in terms of the teaching. You know, each 
person or group of people that he came to, he had to really teach because his whole point was to get each and every sentient being to achieve Buddhahood, to get to a state of perfection. So imagine if you had to go about doing that, you know, get every single sentient being to the state of anything, <laughs> you know, to try to convince them to get to the state, even if it's good. Imagine getting everyone together and convincing them that this is really good for you. You should do this. Even in our own lives, we've known many things are good for us and we don't do them. <laughs> and we concretely know they're good for us and we don't do them. So just imagine being Buddha, who's walking around, you know, 2,600 years ago, you know, and trying to figure out how to help all sentient beings, how to give a message that would help every single sentient being without leaving out any, because no bias, not only helping this group that is say, willing to say that they're holding the final view of Buddha, willing to help every group. So how do you go about doing that? You give a variety of teachings, a variety of scopes, a variety of conclusions that you know are the furthest conclusions that these individuals can each come to. So you teach different tenets and different conclusions to these varying degrees of disciples because you know they have a ceiling on their conclusion, but that conclusion then can be added on to later. <laughs> so the Buddha recognized this and gave a whole bunch of different teachings to different folks. You know, gave the first turning of the wheel of Dharma teaching, uh, and, and it was much more coarse than the second turning of the wheel of Dharma. And then the third turning of the wheel of Dharma, there was a lot of different stuff uh, taught and also an interpretation of the first and the second turning of the wheel of Dharma, which made it actually more coarse <laughs> for because he realized he might have confused some beings at the second turning of the wheel of Dharma. And some of the bodhisattvas pointed out that, you know, they were very high level bodhisattvas and said, Buddha, you know, the first turning of the wheel of Dharma, you said this. Second turning of the wheel of Dharma, you said this, this seems to be different. Now there's people who are confused that, you know, would be, you know, holding a mind only view uh, tenet would be best for them because these were high bodhisattvas. So they were kind of leading Buddha to the, you know, what, you know, the Buddha already knew had to be said. It was just kind of a play <laughs> going on. Uh, but then the Buddha taught the mind only school view um, whilst though explaining very high views that are applicable to no matter how you're looking at the Dharma. Um, so without being able to sort all of this out, according to scope, uh, it could seem like really confusing because the Buddha had a huge task. The Buddha had such a complex thing to do. If you wanna make everyone have, you know, fearlessness and complete bliss, but what each of them needs at that moment is different, then you have a huge task to do. And we as Buddhist practitioners have now the task of sorting it all out. And luckily, going back to my original point, we have the Tibetan commentaries, we have the Indian commentaries, and we have the sutras. So we can see how it all gets sorted out and we can cut and rub the teachings the way the Buddha told us to. Uh, if we have all of these tools, if we have this understanding that the Buddha taught to scope, the Buddha gave a variety of teachings, to some people, the Buddha told them the Four Noble Truths were truly existent. To some people, he told them the, that nothing is truly existent. To some people, he told, well, when I said that nothing was truly existent, I just meant this stuff. <laughs> so the Buddha said a lot of things. And we have to come to the final conclusion. And what your you know, established conclusion is, you know, maybe is different than what my established conclusion is. Um, but when we have a framework to work from, then we can see where it all fits in. And if what's so great about the framework and, and having you know, the educations that we have and our ability to read and look through this material, what's great about the framework is if we see our established conclusion seems to fall in what is called maybe there's Vaibhashika, Satrantika, Chittamantra, and Madhyamika, Madhyamika being the highest. So if we see you know, we're going back to this mirror of the Dharma we talk about. The mirror of the Dharma here is framework. <laughs> so framework of established conclusions. So what is our established conclusion? And if we find that our established conclusion is somewhere in the middle of the tenets, where some, you know, sutra school, satrantika school, or maybe we think everything really is just mind. There's nothing outside of mind. There's no externality ex outside of mind. 
we're falling into maybe mind only school. We'll be able to see where we are at by looking at the framework of all of these tenets. And then by looking at this framework and seeing where we're at, we can weigh where we're at against what these other philosophers say are higher tenets. And we can see if our view in the end tallies with reality or not. And if it doesn't, if it seems like this next view starts to shake what we think is true, we no longer have an established conclusion. <laughs> so we went from the established conclusion that wasn't maybe taking away enough to taking away a little bit more from what we think is the way things exist. Because when we, when we start to dev, delve into philosophy and we look at how uh, objects exist, how we exist, we have to you know, start to take away, you know, Oh, you know, is it just the self of person that, you know, isn't truly existent? Or is it the self of phenomena that isn't truly existent? You know, and, and uh, the earlier schools only deal with the self of person. They don't take away enough. But then we find if you go too far and you take away too much, you end up with nothing. You end up with nihilism. So the sweet spots in the middle somewhere between substantialism inherent existence and, 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 and nihilism. That's a very, very fine line that we have to find. And the only way we'll know where we are in terms of the line, where we think our middle is, is to weigh it against these other concepts and to say, is our middle where Nagarjuna says the middle is? Or does our middle look more like what Basubandhu says the middle is? Or Dharmakirti says the middle is? Or does it look like what the, the beings, the arhats, or you know the uh, you know the the first group of people in the Vaibhashka school at the first turning of the wheel of Dharma? There are eighteen schools broke up <laughs> at that point into just Vaibhashka, and always oh, said this is great. This is you know eight, they're very very similar. You know, does our view kind of land there? And luckily, we have the rest of the framework to weigh it against to see where it is, and, and it's very easy to conclude. Uh, that we're holders of Madhyamaka because most of our teachers just speak most of the time in terms of the middle way consequence school. Uh, they're, you know, Rinpoche and uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, unless they're delving into specific other established conclusions or other tenets, they're usually speaking from the perspective of Madhyamika Prasangika. So we can become very comfortable and confident that we are understanding things in terms of the final view because that's what everyone's been talking about to us. But then when we look at some of the other views and then when we look at what Madhyamika really presents, there's big books about it. It's not just a, the, the paragraph that maybe we can talk about about it. <laughs> you know, when we start to see, do we hold the final view or not? We will probably conclude that the answer is no. Uh, because the final view is extremely, extremely subtle. And without the final view, we can't cut the root of cyclic existence. So it's so important for us to delve into, you know, all of this framework. Uh, we don't have to do it all at once, but to start to look at it from a broader perspective uh, and see how each and every one of these teachings uh, help to understand higher teachings or reinforce other teachings uh, and then our ability to practice will become much more advanced uh, when we have more information uh, to really work through in our analysis. Uh, and that's when we get the wisdom arisen from hearing, we have to have something to analyze. It can't just be the same syllogism we keep saying over and over and over again and feel satisfied with. We have to see if that is how we really feel about the operation of, of, of things. <laughs> if we really feel that things operate not inherently existent, not intrinsically existent, not objectively existent, what does that mean? How do they then operate? Do they operate from their own side or not? Are they only operating from my side or not? Is it both our sides required for them to operate or not? These are all questions that we have to be able to answer. 
uh, and, and see and come to the conclusion that subjectively they're conventionally existent. There's a basis of designation that I'm labeling and that label brings it into existence. So we fall away in Madhyamaka from the extreme of non-existence by saying things exist because they exist through the power of labels. You know, we have a collection of this labeling that, that's taking place that brings it into existence. Um, but things, uh, they, they don't inherently exist. So we, 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 we get out of the extreme of, of non-existence or nihilism by showing, yes, they exist. They come into being through labels. <laughs> Uh, but we see that there's no objective existence or no findability from the object's own side. So uh, that's enough about emptiness for today. Uh, but it's important that we start to sort these things out and start to look at what is inherent existence. What, is, what does it mean uh, that all phenomena lack inherent existence, but all phenomena exist? And by seeing, you know, you know how empty, emptiness, by understanding emptiness, you see how everything can exist and how everything can function. And if things aren't intrinsically existent, how does that make you understand how they function? <laughs> because they're not inherently existent, they can be this or that and function. This is the part where it starts to become more and more difficult uh, to posit. And so we've gone through uh, the great treatise on the stage of the path to enlightenment, the, the introductory section that goes on to how to, you know, the greatness of the teacher, the greatness of the teaching, how to listen to and explain the teachings. And we're in the section on how to lead students through the actual instructions. Uh, we finished the teachings shared in common with beings of small capacity. Uh, we finished those, uh, I, and, uh, I think, two weeks ago, right? Uh, we finished those teachings of on beings of small capacity. Uh, so incredible. <laughs> Since Rinpoche has passed away, we've, you know, started you know, whipping through the Lam Rim Chemo again. And that's what he wanted us to do. He was so happy. I, you know, I'm thinking about, I remember the day specifically when I, where, what should we go? What should we teach? Where should, which, maybe we should go back to the beginning of the Lam Rim. And it was it literally is like somebody told me, you just won the lottery. <laughs> same, same reaction. He was just so full of joy and so happy. Uh, and it makes me so happy to know that him saying, hey, can you please continue on the Lam Rim lineage? And the fact that, okay, it's a year later, we did. <laughs> it's a year later and we went through the small scope and we went through it in pretty good detail, I think. And we went through it in a way that could mean something in terms of how we would practice it. We see how we can taste these teachings in our daily life and they aren't just material that we learn. It's just not stacked up information. It's now actually things that we integrate into our lives or can integrate into our lives. Maybe we already knew that. Um, but it enhanced our ability to see how that we can integrate these things into our lives. And, and uh, I'm, I'm happy that we did that. And I'm happy that we have things like YouTube and we have all these other places where these teachings are just getting to sit. People can look at them, people can go back to them because I know that you know mistakes are said here and there. I hear them in everybody's teachings, but for the most part, you know, 99.9% .9 of what I'm saying is precisely what Ken Sergeshe Wandok said. Uh, and we know that if we can rely, uh, we can rely on that. We know we can rely on Ken Sergeshe Wandok's words. Why? Not because he's Ken Sergeshe Wandok and he had a title and he was the abbot of Namgyal Monastery. Titles and names, you know, Dalai Lama says a lot of lamas have long names and short realizations. <laughs> but this particular lama really paid attention to those five great texts and became one of the greatest living scholars in the world in relation to those five great texts because his teachers were the greatest scholars in the world at the time. And Rinpoche didn't settle for mediocrity ever. He went to the best. His teachers were Trijung Rinpoche and Ling Rinpoche and Zong Rinpoche and Kenser Pema Jetson and Shakar Gen Nima and Gen Lacha and Gen Uze, these incredible giants of philosophy. Uh, we're our grandparents, if you will, or our, yeah, our grandparents, if we look at Rinpoche like a parent who taught us. Uh, I don't know where that puts me, maybe like a cousin or something, I don't know, but like <laughs> stepchild. Anyway, it's, it's my joke, but you know, but that's how I think though, when I think about who these giant beings were, 
I just feel like so small and not in like a way that like, is like, oh, you need to have more self-esteem. No, I just, I, when we think about who Ken Sergeshe Wandag was, we think about the junior and senior tutor of the Dalai Lama who were Rinpoche's teachers. Wow, we think about what Ken Sir Pema Jetson did. Uh, he was the abbot for so long of Drepung all the way into the exile. We think about what he did to keep Drepung together and Zong Rinpoche to keep uh, you know, uh, Ganden and everything together. Uh, we're just, it's an incredible, incredible thing. Uh, and rejoice in the fact that we come from pedigree. <laughs> you know, we really, really do. And we, we know that those teachers we're talking about didn't set, were never satisfied with just limited instructions or partial instructions. They went for the whole gusto all the way to the, you know, final stages of understanding of highest yoga tantra because they knew that this life and that samsara in general really didn't have what Buddhahood or Nirvana has to offer. So they put their sights on what, you know, had the most to offer. Did the things of this life have the most to offer? No. Does samsara have the most to offer? No. Does just a nirviding Nirvana have the most to offer? No. Even though we're in that section in the Lam Rim, we know we have to have all of those realizations. But these great teachers said an abiding nirvana only doesn't even fulfill all of my own needs, let alone all sentient beings' needs. I'm still going to be imperfect. I'm still going to be in a place that isn't just bliss. So luckily, our teachers weren't satisfied with abiding nirvanas. They were only satisfied with Buddhahood and only satisfied with the quickest route to Buddhahood possible. That's the other part, because you know, you could have, okay, we're, we want to get to Buddhahood, but only the perfection vehicle, which takes an incredibly long amount of time to get to Buddhahood. But as Rinpoche said, we can take the shortcut. It's like taking a, 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 you know, a bicycle. Like when we look at all teachings are actually one vehicle. They really are. When we, we look at the highest view, everything the Buddha taught, even the Hinayana vehicle is all just really falls into one vehicle at the end of the day, uh, because all beings will become Buddha. Uh, and the Buddha is, you know, working for the sake of sentient beings and, and has a Sambhokaya until there is no more sentient beings, has an enjoyment body, at least. It's what it says, you know, one of the characteristics is when there's still samsara, there's still enjoyment body being emanated in order to help sentient beings. So then you can infer there's emanation body, unless of course there's only Arya Bodhisattvas left, then the emanation body is not necessary. So in case anybody wants to debate, I'm just putting that disclaimer in there. <laughs> so one of the things about the Sambukaya, the enjoyment body is that it's there until samsara is empty. You know, it's there uh, until, you know, everybody's basically enlightened. Uh, and so that means that everyone will become a Buddha. Everyone has Buddha nature and that the Buddha will go even to those Hinayana Arhats, uh, those photos, those Hinayana Arhats in, in the here in solitary realizer vehicle and somehow encourage them to finish fulfilling all of their needs as well. Um, so we know that this will occur and that the Buddha, uh, is abiding until samsara is completely empty. Um, and yeah. So I forget the main point on that, but let's just move on. So we're in the section on the medium scope, which deals with how to achieve an abiding nirvana. But we know it's called the teaching shared in common with beings of medium capacity because it's foundational practices for the teachings for beings of great capacity. We know when we look at the word bodhicitta, bodhicitta comes from renunciation. You first get a renunciation and want to merge from cyclic existence yourself, and then you can have bodhicitta. Uh, so last week we read a little bit of the Lam Rim Chemo. Um, and let's go, le go back to where we left off, and then I want to read one other thing before we move uh, forward. So uh, we read up to... Um, where it says, hence, it's uh, vitally important to meditate on the faults of cyclic existence. And then it explains that the faults of cyclic existence are going to be explained in three parts, the mental training, the measure of the determination to be free and dispelling misconceptions about it. Okay. Uh, so the mental training is where we begin uh, in the medium scope section. 
and it's on page 267 in the first volume, if anybody's following along. Um, but it's called Identifying the Mind Intent on Liberation. So what does renunciation look like? Identify it. What is this mind that wants to become liberated? Uh, where does it come from? What does it look like? What are its, its aspects? And we know that we have to have this mind uh, in order to get the next mind, the bigger mind, which is bodhicitta, which is the only entrance into the Mahayana, the only way uh, that we can become a Buddha um, and fulfill all of our needs and all of sentient beings' needs. Okay, so liberation means freedom from bondage, and what binds you to what binds you to cyclic existence is karma and the afflictions. Um, so contaminated karmas and the afflictions and their seeds, if we want to be more technical. Uh, this is what bind us to cyclic existence. Under their power, the aggregates are reborn in a threefold manner. In terms of the three realms, they are reborn in the desire realm. So we know that uh, the desire realm, we have all of the six realms of the desire realm. But then the God's realm has also a form and formless realm. So just as to understand this. And Basu Bandhu in the Abhidharma Kosha, I believe it's in that text, makes five realms instead of six because he includes the demigods and the gods in one realm. So this is what the points that are going to be made here are about. So six realms, you know, all have desire realm, but the gods realm has not only desire realm gods, but also form and formless realm gods. Now in Basu Bandhu's interpretation, he would say five realms where he would say hell, hungry ghost, animal, human, and gods, and demigods would be included in gods. But in the other presentations, we have hell, hungry ghost, animal, human, demigods, gods, and then gods being broken up into desire realm gods, form realm gods, and formless realm gods. Uh, so this will be pointed out, but it's, it's good to kind of have a little bit of background before you read it uh, to understand that. Um, Okay, so under their power, the aggregates are reborn in a threefold manner. In terms of the three realms, they were born in the desire realm and so forth. In terms of kinds of beings, they are reborn as the five, deities, humans, animals, hungry ghosts, and hell beings, or six beings uh, to add, and it says the five plus demigods in parentheses. So basically what I just explained. Uh, and in terms of type of birth, they are reborn in four ways, by, by birth from a womb, birth from eggs, birth from heat and moisture, uh, and spontaneous birth. And then, and I remember Depeche the other day in the discussion said, you know, most of us are, are born from the womb. Anyone here miraculously born, raise their hands. So mostly, you know, what we relate to in the human realm is the, the birth from a womb. Uh, since this is the nature of bondage, freedom from rebirth impelled by karma and afflictions is liberation. Uh, so here's a, a little bit of a definition of what uh, liberation would be. It would be freedom, uh, uh, um, since this in the nature is bondage, uh, so being bound to these realms, being bound to suffering, being bound to the three types, among the three types of suffering, at least the pervasive compounded suffering. Uh, this is, you know, uh, uh, you have to be forced into a set of contaminated aggregates among the five. And say among the five because formless realm beings only have four aggregates. <laughs> so you say you're born in among the five uh, aggregates, contaminated aggregates, and you have pervasive compounded suffering. These aggregates are contaminated and you will eventually, even if they're four, uh, have to be thrust into another set uh, of aggregates. Um, so since this is the nature of bondage, this sitch I just explained, uh, being thrust again and again and again, uh, into a set of aggregates, and and it, and it, we don't have any control over it. We don't say I. We don't pick them out before this birth and say I'd like it to you know to have. I want to live to 120, and I want to have blonde hair, and I want to. We don't pick it out like that. We're forced by our previous karmas uh, into those situations. We're forced. You know all the different details. The completing karmas are all filled in. Uh, um, we're thrust by our throwing karma into a specific realm, you know, okay, so now we're going to be a human. So it's like we have an initial burst of karma that throws us into a realm, a hell realm, a hungry ghost realm, an animal realm, a human realm, demigod, god realm, we're thrust in there. But the details around that 
are then filled in by our completing karma, which is innumerable amounts of different causes and conditions and so forth that we've previously engaged in to create our experience of our color, of our shape, of our, uh, you know, everything, uh, the things that we have, whether we're rich, whether we're poor, et cetera, et cetera. All of the details of our existence are filled in uh, by our completing karma. And we read about this in the previous chapters uh, um, that we can go into more detail about another time, but we already went into throwing and completing karma, I believe. Um, so this is bondage, you know, having this over and over and over again happen, having the suffering of suffering, the suffering of change, pervasive compounded suffering, uh, you know, the suffering of suffering we all as humans know so well. Pains, you know, Geshe Dorje Damdu today was talking about aging. He says, you know, the body doesn't really seem, you know, like it's this load we're carrying at first. And as we get older and older and older, you know, the Buddha said that, you know, this, this is a load we carry in, in the kind of coarse uh, points that he made, um, where it almost seemed like he was positing a self that was separate from the aggregates. But he said that these aggregates are a load we carry. Um, and this is a way that we, we, we can start to see the suffering of our existence. And this is why the Buddha spoke in this way, uh, that, that we have to take this load on over and over again. Uh, and if we are not liberated, we are bound to have to take it on over and over again and experience the pains and so forth. So the suffering of suffering, we all know what that's about. You get headaches, you have back pain. I have an enormous amount of back pain these days. You know, as I get older, it increases more and more and more. Now I go see a spine doctor for it. This is a new development and, you know, I have to go get MRIs and, you know, you see uh, how this body uh, can be, you know, be, be, such a form of suffering and how our minds can be so full of anxiety and depression and worry and so forth that this kind of basis of physical and mental basis that we have uh, is really uh, plagued with more and more sufferings. Um, but no matter what is going on, uh, if it's contaminated, it is suffering uh, because if it's in this particular realm, all of this contaminated happiness will eventually turn into to suffering because it has that self-destruct mechanism we've talked about a million times, the suffering of change in it. And even if we were abiding in a realm where we didn't have the suffering of suffering, we didn't have this coarse physical and mental sufferings, we didn't have the suffering of change because everything would just be happy, 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 happy until we died, uh, or, or neutral, neutral, neutral would be a better way to say it until we died in a form or formless realm, uh, however you want to define it. Uh, even if you don't have the suffering of suffering of suffering of change that you're bound, you're bi if you're, you're in samsara, <laughs> if you aren't liberated, you will have to take on another set of aggregates, no matter what state of being you're in. Uh, and this you know, set of aggregates that we're in are really good. And, and usually we're gonna get a worse set <laughs> when we look at the law of probability in terms of our actions uh, and consequences. Uh, likely in, in Arya Deva's 400 verses, he says, most beings are involved in the ignoble that therefore most ordinary beings just go to the lower realms. And the, and the Buddha said that the beings that go from the lower realms to the higher realms are like atoms on a fingernail. The beings that go from the lower realms, to the lower realms are like atoms in the universe. The beings that go from the higher realms to the higher realms are like, are like atoms on a fingernail and beings that go from the higher realms to the lower realms are like the atoms of the universe. Uh, so we see that, uh, you know, because we're mostly involved in the causes for the lower realms, the result will mostly be lower realms. Uh, and no matter what state of bliss or happiness temporarily we're in, uh, if we haven't been liberated, if we haven't gotten rid of the afflictive obstructions and the obstructions to omniscience, it's not true bliss. It's not permanent bliss. It's not permanent fearlessness. So we have to, if we want to have those states of complete freedom, we have to become unbound. So when we look at the first two noble truths, Rinpoche always said the four noble truths have two cause and effect relationships held within them. First, it shows us how we're bound to cyclic existence, <laughs> the truth of suffering and truth of origin. So we see this word bondage. We're bound to cyclic existence. We're bound 
to being forced again and again and again into a set of contaminated aggregates uh, because of this is the superior truth of suffering, this is the period, superior truth of origin. This superior truth of suffering says, hey, you're, you're bound. This is, this is binding, this is suffering, eight sufferings, six sufferings, three sufferings, which we're gonna go over in detail. These are the sufferings that you have to have if you are part of cyclic existence, if you're not liberated. And this is how they come about. This is the superior truth of origin. So this, the Buddha showed us how we're bound. We're bound by self-grasping ignorance that gives rise to inappropriate attention, that gives rise to afflictions, that gives rise to contaminated karmas, that gives rise to samsara. It gives rise to the first truth, <laughs> the truth of suffering, the eight sufferings, six sufferings, three sufferings. So this is how we're bound to cyclic existence. The next two noble truths, the truth of cessation and the truth of path, shows us how we're unbound. So the truth of cessation is liberation. It's being unbound from cyclic existence, being unbound from the truth of suffering because you've gotten rid of what causes the truth of suffering. The reason you're bound is gone. <laughs> so you're unbound. Does it make sense? And the way you're unbound is by relying on the truth of path. The Buddha stated that this is the superior truth of path. And in this section, the teaching shared in common with beings of medium capacity, it's referring to the three highest higher trainings, the highest higher training in ethics, concentration, and wisdom. And those relate to the three baskets, the uh, Vinaya basket, the sutra basket and the abhidharma basket. And so we see those connections that are made to those baskets, that the, the basket of, of Vinaya teaches the discipline, the basket of concentration, um, of sutra basket teaches concentration, and then the basket of, of abhidharma uh, teaches wisdom. Um, so we see uh, that the presentation, this is called the tripitaka, if we're looking at it in Pali, uh, and we see that these three baskets are the practice of a practitioner of medium capacity who wants to achieve a freedom from bondage. So they rely upon these three highest higher trainings to have freedom from bondage, which is cessation. <laughs> cessation is the ceasing of that bondage. <laughs> so looking at how we look at all of these words to understand them, uh, it's so clear. It's so clear how Lama Tsongkhapa writes and why he writes the way that he does. So you take a, you know, you take these incredible commentaries Rinpoche gave us on even different topics, and then we apply them here. We look at the sutras and we apply them here, uh, and it's just never ceases to amaze me that we could look at one of these lines and spend weeks on it. If we look at this, just this word, this is the nature of bondage. How long could we go on about bondage, you know, in terms of being bound to cyclic existence, being bound to have to experience among the eight types of suffering, the suffering of birth, aging, sickness, and death, the suffering of separating from the pleasant, meeting with the unpleasant, not getting what you want, suffering of the appropriated aggregates, the suffering of uncertainty, the, unsu the suffering of insatiability, the suffering of rebirth, the suffering of shucking off bodies, the suffering of going from the high to the low, the suffering of, of not having friends who can go with you, <laughs> the suffering of being all alone, the suffering of suffering, the suffering of change, pervasive compounded suffering. Among those, what is it? Eight plus six plus three, what is that? 17, eight plus six, <laughs> 17. So among those types of suffering, that's bondage. You're bound if you're in cyclic existence to among those sufferings because you have self-grasping ignorance that gives rise to them through this series, this series of things, <laughs> but self-grasping ignorance gives rise to them. And now you're bound. You're bound to have them. <laughs> you are bound. You are tied up. Rinpoche used to say, he'd say it's like a tarpa. It's like a, a rope. You're tied. You're bound to your suffering. You're tied to it. And, and the way that you become freedom, <laughs> free. <laughs> I always think of freedom dogs. That's what they call the dogs in India. Like, no, 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 those dogs are happy. They don't live in the house. They're freedom dogs. <laughs> so the only way that we can be unbound and free is to get rid of the things that causes the binding. So let's read some, uh, some more Tsongkhapa. 
uh, um, I think I made the point about bondage enough about being free, you know, uh, what bondage is and how we become unbound uh, through getting rid of the cause of the binding. Uh, freed okay, so since this in, is the nature of bondage, freedom from rebirth impelled by karma and afflictions is liberation. So what do we say? We say that from grasping at true self, grasping at, you know, the, the, the grasping at phenomena, self, the self of person and phenomena as being truly existent uh, is what gives rise to the inappropriate attention and then gives rise to the afflictions and gives rise to the karma and gives rise to samsara. So it says here, freedom from rebirth impelled by karma and the afflictions is liberation. So we know that afflictions and karma are caused by self-grasping ignorance that causes the inappropriate attention. So if we get rid of self-grasping ignorance, that's the origin of suffering. And then it says that's how we get. So by getting rid of self-grasping ignorance, we can get rid of the karma and afflictions that kind of throw us into this rebirth. And we can achieve liberation. So liberation is an extinguishing, is an abandonment of the afflictions and the contaminated karmas. This Buddhahood is, you know, here we're talking about nirvana, but abandoning the afflictions and their karmas. And how do we do that? We get rid of what gives rise to them, the self-grasping ignorance. By getting rid of the self-grasping ignorance, by applying the antidote of the truth of path, the wisdom path, you know, the understanding of the 16 attributes of the Four Noble Truths, etc. By understanding, by applying the antidote of wisdom, the wisdom realizing the emptiness of all phenomena, then we can achieve liberation because we won't have the karma and the afflictions that that self-grasping ignorance gives rise to. It says then, it says, freedom from rebirth impelled by karma and the afflictions is liberation. And the desire to obtain that freedom is the mind intent on liberation. So that's renunciation, the mind intent on liberation. We translate as renunciation. Sometimes the desire to definitely emerge, I think is the literal translation of Nepar Jonwa, the desire to definitely emerge. Jonwa is to emerge from, uh, to emerge, emerge from what? To emerge from bondage, to be unbound, as Rinpoche would say, to be untied, uh, unshackled, uh, if you will. Moment by moment, the compositional uh, activity of karma and the afflictions arises and is destroyed. But this destruction is not liberation. Uh, though things that have been produced do not abide for a second moment, this destruction is not contingent upon conditions for liberation, such as the cultivation of a remedy, the knowledge of selflessness. So even though you know suffering comes and goes, when it goes, and, you know, and then happiness arises when we're looking at it in terms of happiness, then you're happy, then you're suffering, then you're happy, then you're suffering. The liberation from suffering doesn't mean that 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 suffering's you know causes the potency of the suffering is no longer, so it's gone. That's not liberation from suffering. Uh, liberation from suffering at a macro level, you know, and a micro level, looking at every type of uh, 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 of suffering all together. Uh, that exists down to its most finite point of suffering. Uh, so looking at it in those two ways, um, and we know that uh, the only way that you can abandon that which that suffering we're referring to in a complete way, which is the totality of suffering that's even experienced, you know, when you're experiencing happiness, you have this pervasive compounded suffering, this underlying samsara, uh, um, when we say the destruction of suffering, we're talking about by applying the remedy of that which gives rise to all of it. And what is that remedy? Selflessness, it says. If this were liberation, it would follow that everyone would be liberated without effort. And that's absurd. So if just the coming and going of suffering, well, as soon as it's gone, it's liberation. Uh, if you were thinking that was the case, then that would mean that anybody could just be would just be liberated. If it just meant, you know, somehow figuring out how to put yourself in a bubble of good stuff. <laughs> you know, that wouldn't be liberation because you'd still be in samsara. You'd still, that happiness would be contaminated. Uh, consequently, if you fail to cultivate the remedy, you will be reborn in the future since you only stop rebirth by cultivating the remedy. Uh, so this forced situation 
You know, we have no independence about. And Buddha said, lack of freedom is misery. So that misery of being forced over and over and over again into a set of contaminated aggregates, forced this uncertainty. We don't know who we're going to meet with. Never satisfied while we're, we're in any of the things we're forced into. You know, this, this insatiability that we have. We just, we see this over and over again. So then the method for developing the mind intent on liberation. I'm going to read this small section and then I have one other reading I want to do today. The method for developing the mind intent on liberation. The desire to relieve the suffering of thirst is based on seeing that you do not want to be tormented of thirst. So we're just looking at it in general ways now. Uh, which likewise, the desire to attain liberation, which relieves the suffering of the aggregates appropriated by karma and the afflictions, is based upon a seeing uh, that the appropriated aggregates are flawed insofar as they have suffering as their nature. Unless you develop a determination to reject cyclic existence through meditating on its faults, you will not seek relief from the suffering of the appropriated aggregates. The 400 stanzas says, Arya Davis, 400 verses. How can one who is not disenchanted with this world appreciate peace? Cyclic existence, like home, is difficult to leave behind. So we see the difficulty. We see the need for analysis about the downfalls of cyclic existence. We see how, even though it seems boring sometimes, we keep talking birth, aging, sickness, and death. But okay, that's a great list of stuff. Now, how, does, how do you feel about those things? How do you relate to those things? When you think about being born and think about that suffering of you know, your first breath and how everything feels so rough like sandpaper as a human when you're born uh, and, and any little bit of you know, temperature change is so dramatic for you and you don't know who any of these people are around you, you know, and you're, you're so scared and you're just wanting maybe something for food or maybe another blanket or something, and you don't even you know, have words to express that. That's how you came into this world with another being experiencing an extreme amount of suffering to give birth to you. <laughs> you know, Thinking about that and thinking about having to give someone that much suffering that just to come into this world because we have this self-grasping ignorance. I have to make another mother suffer because I have self-grasping ignorance. And then when, you know, I'm going to suffer in the, the womb in all these different ways we read about in the, in the Lam Rim because of the self-grasping ignorance. And when I'm suffering in the womb, my mother is suffering because I'm in the womb in some ways, <laughs> because of my self-grasping ignorance. We start to really analyze these eight types of suffering and six types of suffering and three types of suffering. It's what makes us get up in the morning and say, I must practice Dharma. Um, you know, Geshe Dorje Damdu talks about when a baby, you know, is born, it, you know, we have to first want to get out of suffering for ourselves. And this is, we're the closest ones to ourselves. We're the ones that, uh, you know, when we, when we think about others, when we think about ourselves, we're, we're more likely uh, going to want to get out of suffering for ourselves initially. And that's how we then relate to others. When you're born as a baby and you're crying, it's because you want something. It's not because you're worried the baby in the crib next to you isn't getting something. <laughs> you know, so we have this desire, you know, uh, to to have freedom from suffering right from the get go, um, and it, it it's something that you know we can work with uh, to try to then cultivate a desire to get rid of suffering altogether and then turn that desire to get rid of suffering altogether for ourselves over to other sentient beings. So it's a process that we go through, but we can see how we're such a good starting point because we want happiness. We don't want suffering. We do everything all day and night uh, to try to be happy and not suffer. Uh, and, and we start here in the Lam Rim with ourselves so that we can really get a distaste for cyclic existence so that we know that you should have it too. Um, so I'm gonna read something by our, our favorite hero these days, the seventh Dalai Lama. <laughs> um, and I think it's really incredible meditation. 
Um, I wish we could bring it up on the screen, but we'll figure out how to do this in the future. Um, but it's called Melancholy Visions. Um, and it's really an incredible meditation on renunciation. I felt like I couldn't not read it uh, as we enter into the various types of suffering uh, and so forth. And I know we talk about suffering around here a lot. I'm sorry, that's Buddha talked about suffering a lot. <laughs> You know, I don't know what to say. You know, if you have renunciation, then you can, you know, put your headphones in, you know, and think about bodhicitta, uh, <laughs> you know, but uh, I certainly still am fooled by and enamored by the things of cyclic existence. Just turn the right song on for me right now, even, and I might, you know, lose, lose it. Uh, you know, I see how even, you know, you know, stimulate. Anyway, it's fine. Let me just read this. Melancholy Visions by the Seventh Dalai Lama. And I'm going to read it slow because we have enough time for me to read it slow. And hopefully we can like think about these stanzas as we go through. Lorinda has said that it'd be nice if we could go through some of the things slower. And Dan Black, a good friend of mine in Idaho, who now I'm talking to a couple times a month, who was Rinpoche's student from a million years ago. Uh, he's involved in another program like the Nalanda Masters program, the Narantha Institute. It's another program, uh, I think, through Kaju uh, lineage. If I'm wrong, I apologize, but I think it's from Kaju lineage. Uh, and he said that, you know, they advise them uh, when they do their meditation. They just take a stanza, they read it, and then they stop for five minutes or so, and they just meditate on it. Um, and, and, you know, because we were talking about, you know, view and analysis and he said sometimes i just like to slow it down and take in everything from that stanza uh and, and really really see how it can affect my mind so we'll do that not so slow but slower than my normal you know 100 miles an hour <laughs> okay melancholy visions rising sun who disperses dark ignorance all kind guru in nature, Manjushri Vajra, Lord possessing the five certainties beneath none, pray, rest on the lotus unfolding within my heart. Watching how unskillful actions bring confusion and how non-dharmic people masquerade as practitioners and play games that create only unnecessary burdens, my heart filled with sadness, giving birth to this song. If this semblance of humanity born of good karma is bound in chains of continuous craving, it finds no time for the joys of the soul, a melancholy scene, oneself harming oneself. The body of a youth with flesh and blood abounding by years, months, and days ever decays. Look anywhere at the body or mind, youth ages, a melancholy scene, life reflecting death. The ferocious gorillas of various elements gathered in the barren land of five lordless aggregates rush in to devour the slender thread of life, a melancholy scene, a body fragile as a bubble. From very birth, life pauses not for a moment, but races onward towards the great lord of death, Life is a walk down a wide road to its end, a melancholy scene, a criminal being led to execution. Since beginningless time, one has walked in samsara, yet neither oneself nor others have arrived. One has known every pain, but still has not learned a melancholy scene, a lunatic hurting self and others. One has wandered from top to bottom of existence and has owned houses and lands for flashes in time. But these things are one, these, these are things one can hold but for a moment. A melancholy scene, a pilgrim attached to a rented bed. In previous lives, one has owned jewels vast as the earth, but riches gathered with greed and unable to satisfy soon fall into the hands of others, a melancholy scene, an old dog 
guarding its master's house. When wealth and fame come, friends and relatives gather, but though one is good to them with the smallest condition, they turn hostile and feel only en en enmity, a melancholy scene, kindness left unreturned. The ways of a disciple are charming and sweet, yet if mixed with the habit of seeing faults in the guru, they become a broom sweeping away the potential of both, a melancholy scene, a prisoner tormented by his keepers. Day and night, one feeds one's stomach, yet only bad karma, stress, and confusion ensue. The body of fallible elements easily becomes an enemy, a melancholy scene being dependent upon a weak protector. The restless mind roaming like an angry wind helplessly drawn in, is drawn to the channels of the senses. It runs mad, unable to pause for a moment on the useful, a melancholy scene, a living being propelled by delusion. Busily, we collect the useless luxuries of this life, but the more we get, the more we disturb self and others. Hoarding wealth, but provokes a flood of problems, a melancholy scene, a small gain for a huge loss. The person who always gets but never gives and consumes what people hold dear as their flesh is a devil obscuring his own happiness, a melancholy scene thinking poison is medicine. Countless tortures are suffered by the beings of the hells as molten earth and flames from red hot houses of iron burn everything inside and out a melancholy scene being used as fuel for hell's fires. The ghost searches in vain for a million years, his days and nights only cycles of misery, yet neither friend nor environment can help him. A melancholy scene, everything seeming hostile. The animal lives in a vicious and cruel world. He suffers from enslavement by others and his mind is blind as a rock to spiritual potential, a melancholy scene having no hope of liberation. In the realms of the lower gods, the possession of others only kindle flames of jealousy and pierce the heart like a thorn. The only difference between that hell is altitude. That and hell is altitude. A melancholy scene a life and death passed in vain. The desire gods enjoy every pleasure, but never for a moment no satisfaction. And to them, death is hell itself, a melancholy scene, attachment to a child's toys. In the form and formless realms born from samadhi, one knows bliss sublime, but led by karma and delusion, Again, one must plunge to infinite misery, a melancholy scene, a marmot imitating a meditator. Now, as the sun of the Buddha Dharma is setting, most practitioners live in complete opposition to truth. All they do is kill time, a melancholy scene using Dharma for a mere show. Inexperienced lamas, force dry words, never understood, into the ears of lazy, faithless disciples, who in turn throw dharma into depths of pettiness, a melancholy scene, teacher and student, but acting out roles. The law speaks of justice, but favors the powerful. Citizens cannot use freely even what they own, while everybody abuses everyone higher than themselves, a melancholy scene, head and tail, each worse than the other. The karmic fruit of harming others bursts and covers our walls with every, every spiteful condition, inviting a swarm of evil men, gods and spirits, a melancholy scene, a person condemning himself or herself. That called samsara is a house of scorching iron, blazing with misery in every room. It seems so normal that it wearies the spirit, a melancholy scene wandering through savage lands. Look at any man or woman, high or low, 
They may differ in dress, character, and strength, but finally, enmeshed in misery, they are made one, a melancholy scene, friends and relatives of equal ill fortune. One tries to practice and develop one's mind, but because of beginningless immersion in darkness, the white mind of truth is rarely seen, a melancholy scene, effort producing no fruit. It may seem that one is following a spiritual path, yet if one's practice is tied to the eight worldly concerns, it's only a matter of calling samsaric activity spiritual. A melancholy scene, everything going wrong. Every experience of the cold waters of suffering is a result of one's own previous karma alone, a product of one's own mistakes, a melancholy scene, blaming anything on another. If there is a way to become free from misery, one should use each moment to achieve it. Only the fool wants more pain, a melancholy scene, knowingly eating poison. The pup addicted to mindlessness should look at his conduct, which lacks awareness of Dharma, for he is swimming into the depths of a sea of turmoil, a melancholy scene, not working for liberation. The masses propelled by the black wind of delusion wander helplessly in ways as dangerous and rough as a mountain pass, and the end is still far away, a melancholy scene, the ripening of previous negativity. The holy teachers discard as grass their own interests, and walk the path which always only benefits others. Yet we look on them as cunning and malicious, a melancholy scene scorning the wish-fulfilling cow, pretending to show the path of freedom to another when one's own mind is not at all with truth, is merely a cause of exhausting the two, a melancholy scene deriving, deceiving self and others. As this age of five darknesses ever up deepens, duplicity and a falsity everywhere abound, and things just get uglier with each passing year, a melancholy scene, mankind reaching the bottom. O oh, precious gurus, eradicators of misery, look at how violence, evil, and confusion thrive. Masters who develop the Bodhi mind for all beings, Teachers, objects of refuge, never abandon the world. Others have experienced the same sufferings as I, for all samsara tosses in waves of pain. May, be, may we be aware of the faults of lacking spiritual joy and never lose sight of the detached mind. The practice of gentleness, free of hostility, brings happiness in both this and future lives. Therefore, May we see as more kind than our parents, those who harm us and thus give us the chance to train in the mind of sublime patience. The 80,000 types of obstructing spirits that surround us are but teachers to propel us on the path of Dharma. Therefore, may we see them as a guru, tantric deity and Dharma protector and exert ourselves even more for enlightenment. When body and mind throb with aches beyond conception, may we make a profound effort to visualize them as friends who share our ripening black karma, and thus may our thoughts abide in unmoving joy. In brief, whenever any harm befalls us, may we see our pain as the product of a negative mind. May we meditate on taking the world's misery upon ourselves and thus our negative conditions turn into aids on the path. Looking inside one's own body and mind doesn't exist to be harmed. Looking out, harmful agents are like a rope mistakenly seen as a snake. Therefore, may we understand suffering as the creation of a mind that sees as truth that which is mere mental fabrication. Although one may receive the heart of Buddha's teachings from the mouth of a fully experienced master, still it is difficult to tame one's own mind, for we have long been addicted to samsaric waves. 
Suffering and pain pervade this entire world. Therefore, I pray we may shed it as a snake sheds its skin and quickly reach such abodes of perfection as Sukhavati, pure land of bliss, and Vajrayogini's Kajushing. Having entered the sublime path of yoga, tantric yoga, may we bring the scenes of a world polluted by ignorance into the focus of wisdom, peerless and supreme, and thus spontaneously become a circle of three kayas. May we discover the firmness of perfect enlightenment and then release activity manifesting effectively for world beings tormented by ghosts of duality. Thus may the name of samsara be erased. Another wonderful reflection from the seventh Dalai Lama. I find it just so incredible that we have these works that we can look at that can help us see how someone who has shaped their mind thinks. Uh, and we see how they think is just thinking in logical ways, thinking by reflecting on how things truly are, reflecting on our empirical world, reflecting on our own experiences seeing that our own experiences prove the Buddha right when we look at the first noble truth. And when we look at beginningless time and we look at consciousness and we analyze consciousness and we use Dharmakirti's Pramanavartika Karika to help us to understand how consciousness has no beginning by seeing that this moment's consciousness is caused by a previous moment's consciousness. And this moment's breathing in and out was caused by previous breathing in and out. And this moment sense uh, uh, faculties, uh, sense powers rather, were caused by previous moment's sense powers. Uh, and when we look to find a beginning, we won't be able to find a beginning. We see that since beginningless time, we've had this consciousness, but we've only known ourselves I've only known myself as Jeff, as this embodiment, uh, embodied consciousness, uh, my consciousness embodied in this thing I called Jeff for the last 50 years or so. But since consciousness had no beginning, we had all of these different previous lives where we've experienced all of these different things. And because our consciousness has no end, we will experience future lives. And when we see that our experience when we start to study karma is dictated by our previous actions, we begin to see, stop the heart, the slightest wrongs of the many wrongs we do and try to carry out instead each and every good of the many that we may. Like it says in Lama Tsongkhapa's source of all my good, you know, bless me to do this, bless me to, you know, abandon all non-virtue and engage in only perfect virtues. Just like Buddha said, you know, the Buddha said, this is the teaching of the Buddha, uh, abandon evil, engage in perfect virtues. Uh, subdue your mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Um, so we see that when we start to study karma and we start to see that our consciousness has no end and we start to see that our experiences will be dictated by our actions and that our experiences now are dictated by our previous actions. We engaged in some sort of action out of ignorance uh, that planted a seed in our consciousness that then has now ripened into this potential existence. It ripened into the existence that's Jeff. Uh, and with all of my different completed karmas, with all of my ways of being, you know, some good ways of being, some annoying ways of being, uh, uh, some, some happinesses, you know, in terms of samsara happinesses and some sufferings and so forth, you know, some problems with money sometimes, some problems not with money sometimes, all of these experiences come into being from previous causes and conditions causally concordant things, you know, and if I'm experiencing suffering, then the cause was some sort of non-virtue I engaged in. So help me stop the slightest wrong of the many wrongs that I do, because I want to have happiness and try to carry out instead each and every good of the many that we may, because I want to have happiness. And I know that from virtue comes happiness, from suffering, from non-virtue comes suffering. So we put all of this in perspective. And the reason that we're motivated to modify our behavior so much is because we've studied the first noble truth well, because we've been thoroughly convinced that this is the eight sufferings. This is the six sufferings. It's what we got, the three sufferings. It's what we have. <laughs> we're convinced of it. And until we're thoroughly convinced of it, 
so we're so convinced we sound when we talk like the seventh Dalai Lama, when we talk about suffering, we talk about, you know, the happiness of cyclic existence being like the honey we're, you know, licking off of a razor blade, you know, when we believe that and start talking like that, you know, that's a result of us having thoroughly analyzed our reality. It isn't because, you know, these are poetic words and, you know, I, good ways to put things. These are because people like the seventh Dalai Lama meditated on the truth of suffering and then meditated on it more and meditated on it more and got to the point where they woke up in the morning and said, I want out. And then they woke up in the morning after, you know, some other practices and said, I want out, I want out and I want to be the most reliable guide in the universe because I want everyone out. And those minds came from analysis, those, satu those saturated minds that became, this is the way I think, became this is the way they think because of analyzing these things that we're learning. <laughs> so we have the wisdom arisen from learning or hearing. Well, we're learning about all of this. Now we need to analyze it. As Pabunka Rinpoche says, we can't just have learned it and say, yeah, that's true. That sounds good. Yep, birth, aging, aging's bad. Sickness, pretty bad. Death, super bad. <laughs> Getting away from unpleasant things, meeting with unpleasant things. Yeah, I don't want to, you know, meet with unpleasant things. Separating from things I like, that stinks, you know? <laughs> like just having this kind of course, yeah, that makes sense. Without delving into it, doesn't make you land on this inference that makes you have renunciation. There's no way. There's no way just knowing the Four Noble Truths and me saying the eight sufferings, because I just said all of them, eight sufferings, six sufferings, I just listed them all. So everybody should be thoroughly convinced because these are facts of reality. So you should literally do nothing but focus from this moment on, on getting out of cyclic existence and all hobbies, everything else. Like at this moment, if just the information was enough, <laughs> I gave it all to you, the eight suffering, six suffering, three suffering, and you know, the origin of it <laughs> and the path to get out of it. And, how, and it can be gotten out of it. Just that, you know, facts were enough because I gave you the facts. You should, you know, and if you didn't need to look into these facts more, you should leave this teaching convinced because these are facts. These aren't, you know, ideas that could or could be or might be true. These are facts. And if these are facts, once, you know, because we know that a mind of valid cognition has recognized that these are facts. Those who have analyzed these things thoroughly have come to the conclusion that these are facts. If we analyze these and come to our conclusion in a thorough way that these are facts, there's no way because of our going back to the baby in the crib, our desire to be free from suffering and our desire to have happiness, there's no way if we analyze this enough and believed it beyond a shadow of a doubt, we would do anything but practice Dharma. And we know that's not the case. We know that our minds don't work like that yet because they have not been saturated with enough analysis. We know a lot of facts. <laughs> we have a whole bunch of information in our minds that seems pretty good. Yeah, I'm correct in assuming it's true. But have I tasted this to the point where that part of me that only wants to be happy and wants to be free from suffering that turns on tunes as loud as they can go, you know, which isn't, I'm not saying, I'm not making a judgment on it. I'm just saying, this is what I do. This is one of my escapes is to turn on tunes as loud as they would go. You know, I wouldn't find that that was going to get me to the happiness I was looking for. I would see that as a distraction from my goal of happiness. So when I'm like having an instinct to want to make myself happy, my instinct would immediately make me practice Dharma if I've analyzed this correctly. My instinct wouldn't be to go, you know, have some sort of, you know, intoxication through visually or auditory intoxication or actual intoxication, whatever your thing is, you know my instinct wouldn't be to go towards those kind of things. My instinct would be to only go towards liberation because when we look at our instinct is to want to be free from suffering and want happiness. 
And if we really, really believe this beyond a shadow of a doubt, we'd believe it as much as the fact that if I turn on some, you know, 90s hip hop as loud as it'll go, I'm going to be happy <laughs> for a minute <sighs> until I'm like embarrassed that I've done it again. You know, embarrassed, not in the music choice, embarrassed that, OK, I'm distracted completely again. And now I've got to untangle all of these, you know, kind of strange, you know, ideas that come into my head when I get lost into you know, non-reality. But I would not want to get lost in non-reality. I would want to get to reality if I knew that was real happiness. If I knew that these other things were just more salt water. I don't go drink salt water when I'm thirsty because I know it doesn't quench my thirst. I, I could be as thirsty as I could possibly be. And I'm going to look at the ocean and know that's not going to work. I better, you know, go find some other kind of potable source, something to drink, because that's not going to quench my thirst. So when we study suffering enough, when we study the Four Noble Truths enough, then we know, even if the moment arises in our mind, I'm going to go do that. We know that that's just salt water. As much as we would standing by an ocean, we wouldn't, we would go to the concession stand. <laughs> we're at the beach and go buy a bottled water. We wouldn't, you know, go to the front the ocean, even if it's like we're standing like in our ankles in it. We know it's wet, it's water. <laughs> we know that it's salt water and it's not going to satisfy our craving. It's not going to satisfy our thirst. So we'll turn around <laughs> usually and walk to the concession stand to quench our thirst. We won't bend down and drink the water. We'll go get the water that will really work. Same thing for when you get renunciation. That's what Tsongkhapa is talking about. Day and night seeking transcendent liberation. Day and night knowing better. Knowing that the only thing that can help me at the time of death is Dharma. When you have renunciation, you know that third root of the, you know, the three roots. Death will come, nothing can stop it. We don't know when we're going to die. And the only thing that can help is Dharma. You realize that if you have renunciation, the only thing that can help is Dharma. And that's what you do in order to have happiness. And when you recognize that this is the way to true freedom, it gives you more freedom than you've ever had. <laughs> it's such a strange concept, I, I know. And it doesn't seem like it, but I've seen it in beings who've gotten it, who've understood what true freedom was about and just threw away all of the stuff that I try to gather in cyclic existence to try to make myself happy. They just, they used them. I saw these beings using them and, you know, and not like trying to not enjoy things either, but just not buying it anymore. Not buying it any longer. And, you know, while they, you know, I'd see Rinpoche uh, in the car and I'd have the music on and, and I'd look over at him and sometimes he'd smile and he'd even turn the music up as a joke sometimes. Uh, when I was much, much younger and I had a very large music system in my car and I didn't understand, you know, that Rinpoche probably didn't want to hear uh, Sick of It All, the hardcore band, turned up as loud as it could possibly go with four 10 inch subwoofers. He used to joke and say, no, no, I like it. It's like in the monastery when they're banging all the things together. <laughs> it's what he compared like punk rock hardcore music to like when everyone's playing different instruments at once in the monastery <laughs> he says you know it's it's great it's an offering if you think of it like an offering that it's good and i would just see rimbache you know actually thinking of things like an offering and turning everything into dharma practice uh and knowing that you can use these things and be day and night seeking transcendent liberation but don't fool yourself and don't pretend you're using them for that. And when I saw someone who was really able to convert everything into path and hearing like, blah, 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 you know, I used to listen to interesting music and, uh, and be in bands like that and seeing him just in a state of complete peace when I'm like inside, like ready to, you know, like erupt in some sort of, uh, you know, I don't know, testosterone induced event. <laughs> you know, that hardcore brings about, you know, I see him just at this complete state of peace, enjoying this cacophony of noise that he's making into an offering while he's doing mantras. 
And I just saw, you know, someone so unwilling to buy into anything other than liberation. And when I was with Rinpoche, that it was just such a great example. And I saw him be able to, in, in, you know, interact in full of samsara while day and night seeking liberation, day and night working for the sake of all sentient beings. So um, we have to be careful when we hear this word renunciation. Uh, some people think, okay, I've got to just sell all my stuff. <gasps> the story of the person who read Milarepa's life story, uh, Rinpoche always used to tell, and read the life story one time and said, okay, that's it. I got to be like Milarepa. I'm going to a cave. <laughs> and then he sold all of his stuff, gave away his stuff to townspeople, you know, got some tattered robes of some sort. We know Milarepa had some white tattered robes only, uh, and maybe a bull. And, uh, you know, tried to go live like Milarepa and then went into the cave without having any spiritual preparedness for this. Just thinking that renunciation, if I want to get out of cyclic existence, I've just got to get out. I mean, the cave is cyclic existence. <laughs> you know, wherever you are, you have this grasping is your cyclic existence. If you're in a cave, if you're in a tree house, if you're in a retreat. Wherever you are, that's your cyclic existence. The only way to abandon is to apply the, the remedies, but doing some geographical, as we call it, <laughs> a geographical cure isn't going to turn your life into the life of Milarepa. Because Milarepa required enormous amounts of teaching and enormous amounts of imprints and you know, previous lives and meeting with Marpa and getting all entire Lamrim teachings from Marpa and having Marpa do all these things to help him purify his non-virtues. And then he went into retreat for 11 months. And then he wrote about that retreat. He did all of this stuff, all of this. He had all this spiritual preparedness. Yet we read renunciation and we as Westerners are like, okay, all right, I want the fast track. You know, I'm just going to, okay, it's time for me to just shut it all down, <laughs> turn it all off. And we try to do things we're not capable of doing. So we have to be honest with ourselves and where we are at and sometimes turn the music on. if We need to turn the music on. But recognize that that's not really happiness and it's not really a good use of our time. And the more and more we become convinced because of the first noble truth about this, the, more we, we, the less we need those distractions. So the man goes into the cave without the spiritual preparedness, like me, if I just like today. So that's it. <laughs> I'm going to be in a cave now. You know, I sometimes think about what that would be like. Sometimes I, in my mind, think I could do it. And then sometimes I realize, you know, mm, probably not. So then, <laughs> so then he goes to the cave and two weeks later, the village people see him coming like back to town, you know, and he's got his tattered stuff on and he's upset. <laughs> He's mad, mad at Milarepa. He says, Milarepa was not telling the truth. He said, I could achieve liberation in this way. Uh, and it wasn't true. And he became so discouraged. And then he went back to everybody and tried to get all of his stuff back <laughs> uh, and became very discouraged. Um, and then, I don't know, he practiced. Was he set straight? The story, I don't know. You can end the story the way you'd like to end the story. I never heard the ending of the story. And then he meets with, you know, so-and-so and, you know, goes back to the cave 15 years later and becomes an arhat. I'd like to think the story ends like that. Comes a Buddha arhat, you know, somehow he meets, you know, with a descendant of Milarepa who says, no, no, Marpa taught all of these things to Milarepa and Milarepa had all of these imprints. And you too must learn the teaching shared in common with beings of small capacity and the teaching shared in common with beings of medium capacity and the teachings for beings of great capacity. And then this practitioner said, oh, I didn't realize I needed a foundation. <laughs> and then engaged in all of these practices and then was able to then 15 or 20 or 30 years later or whenever go back to the cave and actually realize the nature of the mind that Milarepa realized. Um, so that's how I'm gonna end the story. I don't know if that's how the story ends, but my uh, fictional story, the fictional part is the part, I only know the true story about him coming back really upset with Milarepa and wanting all his stuff back. Uh, so uh, now the fictional part that I'm making up is the part where then he then meets with the descendant of Milarepa, and gets set straight.
<laughs> he meets with some people who say, you know, the new Tsongkhapa's teachings and say, yeah, Milarepa had all of it. He had the view of emptiness completely, uh, but because he had the teachings shared in common with beings of small and medium capacity and the teachings for beings of great capacity, he had renunciation. You can't go get renunciation by making a geographical change. You can make factors conducive to it. Don't get me wrong. We want to be in the most conducive place possible, but we know that the Buddha did all of those years of ascetic practice where he didn't eat and he didn't sleep and he deprived himself of so many things and realized reality after he ate something, you know, and was able to be nourished and realized, you know, the middle way, not based upon like, we'll eat a little, but realized that what the middle way view was about things. Um, a lot, the middle way view can pertain to the Madhyamika view, but it can also re re refer to not being extreme, not being engaging in extreme aesthetic practices, but also not indulging so much. So not taking, you know, like, like with emptiness, we don't want to take too much away, but we don't want to add too much. This, you don't want to take too much away, but you don't want to have too much, um, you know, indulgence. So the middle way is always talking about that middle, middle path. So that's enough today. Uh, in closing, if you're attached to this life, you're not a spiritual practitioner. If you're attached to samsara, you have no renunciation. If you're attached to your own self-interest, there is no bodhicitta. If you have grasp, if there is grasping, you do not have the view. Enthused by great compassion, you taught the immaculate dharma to dispel all perverted views. To you, the Buddha Gautama, I pay homage. Okay, read some closing prayers. Let's read the uh, eight verses for training the mind by Geshe Lanri Tamba. Uh, eight verses is something that we can think about in our daily lives over and over and over again. Uh, and when we become discouraged on the path, it's something that we can say, oh, other great masters by Geshe Langri Tamba uh, was discouraged or met with people that were difficult or saw that his mind wasn't going the right way all of the time. Uh, so here's some advice on what to do if that happens to you <laughs> from a great bodhisattva. So we see that we have to give ourselves a break sometimes. Uh, and uh, you know, understand that, you know, this is not going to be a quick process, um, but we shouldn't be lazy. Eight verses for training the mind by Geshe Langritamba with the determination to accomplish the highest welfare of all sentient beings who surpass even a wish granting jewel. I will learn to hold them supremely dear. Whenever I associate with others, I will learn to think of myself as the lowest amongst all and respectfully hold others to be supreme from the very depths of my heart. In all actions, I will learn to search into my mind. And as soon as a disturbing emotion arises, endangering myself and others, I will firmly face and avert it. I will learn to cherish ill-natured beings and those oppressed by strong misdeeds and suffering as if I had found a precious treasure difficult to find. When others out of jealousy treat me badly with abuse, slander, and so on, I will learn to take all loss and offer victory to them. When the one whom I have benefited with great hope unreasonably hurts me badly, I will learn to view that person as an excellent spiritual guide. In short, I will learn to offer to everyone without exception, all help and happiness directly and indirectly and respectfully take upon myself all harm and suffering of my mothers. I will learn to keep all these practices undefiled by the stains of the eight worldly concerns and by understanding all phenomena as like illusions be released from the bondage of attachment. Now, a prayer for the flourishing of Lama Tsongkhapa's teachings. Though he's the father, producer of all conquerors, as a conqueror's son, he produced the thought of upholding the conqueror's dharma in infinite worlds. Through this truth, may the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. When in the presence of Buddha Indraketa, he made his vow, the conqueror and his offspring praised his powerful courage, the, uh, through this truth, may the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. That the lineage of pure view and conduct might spread, he offered a white crystal rosary to the sage and, ga and who gave him a conch and prophesied. Through this truth, may the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. His pure view, free of eternity or destruction, his pure meditation cleansed of fog and fading, his pure conduct practiced according to the conqueror's orders, may the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. Learned, since he extensively sought out learning, 
reverent, apl rightly applying it to himself, good, dedicating it for all beings in the doctrine, may the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. Through being sure that all scriptures definitive and interpretive were without contradiction, advice for one person's practice, he stopped all misconduct. May the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. Listening to the explanations of the three pitakas, realized teachings, practice of the three highest higher training, his skilled and accomplished life story is amazing. May the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. Outwardly calmed and subdued by the hearer's conduct, inwardly trusting in the two stages of practice, he allied without clash the good paths of sutra and tantra. May the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. Combining voidness explained as the causal vehicle with great bliss achieved by the method, the effect vehicle, heart essence of 80,000 Dharma bundles, may the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. By the power of the ocean of oath bound doctrine protectors, like the main guardians of the three beings paths, the quick acting Lord, Vaishravana, Karmayana, may the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. In short, by the lasting of glorious Guru's lives, by the earth being full of good, learned, reverend holders of the teaching, and by the increase of power of its patrons, may the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. And we'll make a mandala offering. Thanksgiving mandala offering. The fundamental ground is scented with incense and strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this is a Buddha land and offer it. May all sentient beings enjoy this pure realm. I dedicate whatever virtues I have collected for the benefit of the teachings and of all sentient beings, in particular for the essential teachings of Venerable Lozandrapa to shine forever. I send forth this jeweled mandala to you, precious guru. Any mistakes that I've made, may they be purified by this mantra of Vajrasattva, imagining Vajrasattva who's inseparable from Kensar Geshe Wandak or from your root Lama, because we know the Lama is inseparable from the Yidam. So we imagine... Uh, Vajrasapha in the space in front of us and that light light rays and nectars are coming from Vajrasapha, white light rays and nectars are coming from Vajrasapha uh, and transforming into ohms and, and, pure, and dissolving into our crowns and purifying our body. Imagine that red light rays and nectars are showering down, transforming into red ahs, going into our throat and purifying our speech. And blue light rays and nectars are showering down, transforming into blue ohms, going into our hearts and purifying our minds. Imagine this visualization as we, I, or I recite the Vajrasattva mantra. You can recite it as well too, if you know it. Om Benza Sata Samaya Manu Balaya Benza Sata Sena Vajisha Dede Me Baba Zuto Gaya Me Baba Zubo Gaya Me Baba Anurata Me Baba Sava City Me Prayacha Sava Kama Zuche Me Kitam Shri Am Guru Hum Ha 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 Ho Bhagavan Sava Tata Gata Benza Mame Munka Benza Baba Maha Samaya Sapa Ah, om ve. May we always be protected by Paul and Lamo. Jarama Jarama Jaja Rama Tunja Gala Rajimo Rama Judacha Tunjo Rudu Rudu Hung Jo Hung Jo Rama Jarama Jaja Rama Tunja Gala Rajimo Rama Judacha Tunjo Rudu Rudu Hung Jo Hung Jarama Jarama Jaja Rama Tunja Gala Rajimo Rama Judacha Tunjo Rudu Rudu Hung Jo Hung Jo Rama Jarama Jaja Rama Tunja Gala Rajimo Rama Judacha Tunjo Rudu Rudu Hung Jo Hung Jarama Jarama Jaja Rama Tunjo Gala Rajimo Rama Judacha Tunjo Rudu Rudu Hung Jo Hung Jo Rama Jarama Jaja Rama Tunja Gala Rajimo Rama Judacha Tunjo Rudu Rudu Hung Jo Hung Jarama Jarama Jaja Rama Dunjo, Gala Raja Mo Rama Waja Daja Dunjo, Rudu Rudu Hung Jo I dedicate all this virtue to emulate the knowledge of the hero Manjushri and likewise Samantabhadra as well with whatever dedication is praised as supreme by all the conquerors who traverse the three times. I also dedicate all my roots of virtue for the sake of auspicious deeds. And the long life prayer for His Holiness the Dalai Lama in that pure land surrounded by snowy mountains, you are the source of all benefit and happiness. All powerful Abu Gateshvara Tenzin Yatso, may you stay until samsaras end. Now, last, uh, we'll do the prayer for Kensar Geshe Wandak. A complex yogi poses as a simple monk. Homage to Kensar Geshe Wandak Rinpoche, our precious spiritual friend who is inseparable from Aryatara. I fully prostrate, covering as many atoms of the earth as possible to your pure body, speech, mind, and enlightened activities. I offer to you drinking water, bathing water, flowers, incense, candles, scented water, food, and music purified by Om Ah Hom. The rarity of having one million wish-fulfilling gems, 
is a common occurrence compared to meeting with a holy teacher like you, who placed the complete path to Buddhahood in our childlike hands. Just like a teacher who came to Tibet with a lamp to dispel the darkness of ignorance, you kind abbot arrived in the West with a lineage purer than a diamond and begged us never to be satisfied with partial instructions. The teachings of the extensive deeds and profound view lineages flowed from your lips like nectar for our ears that elucidated the teachings for beings of three capacities. Now the sound is stopped. All composite things are impermanent. You told us that all of your teachers passed away and understood the sadness in treating us to continue our studies. The Buddha does not wash away the negativities of beings, nor does he remove their miseries by his hands. His spiritual realizations are not transferred to them. It is by teaching the truth of suchness that beings are liberated. We are not prepared to take this difficult journey to the highest goodness of Buddhahood without your continued guidance. The sadness in our hearts would be too overwhelming. May you swiftly return to this world and take care of us in all of our lives, wherever we may be, never leaving our hearts and crowns. May all sentient beings perfectly realize, realize renunciation, bodhicitta, and the correct view of emptiness so they know who you really are. Thanks, everybody. Change your minds little by little and make them more like Buddha's mind. And we can do that because we have the ingredients for Buddha's mind. <laughs> we just have to cook them, put them together, and then once they're all ready and we've put them into our minds and we've cultivated them, uh, we'll be perfect. Uh, so we have the ingredients to make ourselves into Buddhas. So let's start cooking. <laughs> See everybody. <laughs>